So this is a talk about graph sync. Um, I want to tell you guys a little bit about what it is, what it can do, and how it came to be and how it came to be what it is today. Um, uh, and <laughs> like a VH1 behind the music docu documentary, there was some, there's a lot of really awesome and early unexpected success followed by a ton of debauchery and regret. Um, <laughs> so in any case, um, uh, uh, this is going to be a little bit of an, uh, I'm going to kind of go over a bunch of concepts, but then there's, a, there's plenty of room for inter, uh, interaction and Q and A, which is a sub text that these slides are not actually fully finished. Um, uh, okay, so what is GraphSync? GraphSync is a libp2p protocol that allows a requester to express an IPLD selector query uh, to a responder, uh, and then the responder executes the query and sends back to the requester all the blocks needed to satisfy the query, and the responses are designed to be sent back in a way that allows the requester to incrementally verify incoming data against the query. So you can run a selector, you can get the responses back, and you can process them in a way that does not force you to absorb the whole graph before you know if you're getting the right stuff. Um, this is the graph sync message format. Oh, it's, I, I know this is too much to put on the slide, um, but I want to point out a couple things. So you can see a request, you can see a response, you can see a block. Um, and then you can see the message, which is the one at the bottom. Now, you may or may not be able to see this, but um, you'll notice that the graphic message has, like, multiple requests in it. Um, and then the graph sync response, then it has the graph sync responses, but there's also, like, blocks that are, like, not directly tied to responses. Um, so that's the format. It's, like, a bunch of requests some responses that are mostly response codes and metadata, and a bunch of blocks. Now, you might be thinking that's a little bit of a weird like format for like a request response protocol um, uh, to send around selector queries and get, get like a stream of data back. Um, and that is because GraphSync is not actually a request response protocol. It is a PubSub protocol, just like Bitswap. You can see this looks a lot like a bunch of wants uh, and a bunch of responses uh, and a bunch of block responses. Um, so this is probably the um, record scratch freeze frame moment where we wonder how we got here. Um, and uh, so in, in essentially, I started here at uh, Protocol Labs uh, uh, working on BitSwap, trying to fix some critical performance problems we were having with the gateways, um, uh, which you may have heard this, this story as a starting, uh, starting point for Protocol Labs. Um, and I worked on that for about six months, made some progress. I worked on some of the early session stuff, um, uh, did some code cleanup, whatnot. Um, and at the time, there was this idea that we would write this other protocol, this future protocol that had been thrown around for years called GraphSync. Um, and eventually, uh, one day I was called into a meeting where basically, uh, you know, they said, write this protocol. And I, I was, I used to be a web consultant. And when I got to work on IPFS, I have to say like the first six months, which is like, this is, I am in like such an amazing place getting to do such cool stuff. And I really felt a little outclassed and I really wanted to prove myself. <laughs> um, and so I was like, yeah, sure, I could totally do that uh, on the theory that this would be a way to uh, show that I knew something. Um, uh, and uh, it, was, it was challenging and I wrote it. Uh, and uh, I'll give you a very brief introduction to how it works um, and then some of the challenges. Okay, so first of all, what are selectors? Uh, I know people, are, like, I'm not going to go too deep into this because folks probably have heard this term before a lot, but they may not. But I do know that most people haven't dug into what they actually are. Um, uh, so I just want to go, like, just give you some a very brief intro on selectors. Um, so selectors are essentially a language for expressing queries against an IPLD graph. They're quite powerful or quite expressive. Um, here's just a couple examples. Um, we have one that's called like explore fields, which means given like a data structure that's a map, go down one or more paths in that map based off of a set of keys, right? Um, we have uh, explore recursive, which is like do this selector and then 
go down the path with that with a selector and then do it again and do it as many times as, and up to a limit. Um, we have like there are some lesser known ones like Explore Index, which allows you to do a selection in uh, in a list. Um, and or actually no, that's Explore Range, but Explore Index allows you to get a numbered item out of a list. Um, and then there's another one called there's there's also a really wild one that I don't think anyone here has used called Explore Union that does actually work, um, which allows you to run two selectors tr simultaneously, like on the same graph, and then like combine the result, um, which is pretty wild. Um, but again, most folks don't use it, use it that much. Here is an example of a selector that you can now use in Go. Um, you can do a Unix FS path selection, um, which is super duper awesome. And that is not actually a selector. That is a function uh, that you call with some Go library code because assembling that selector is quite complicated. Um, so selectors are an incredibly powerful language that can do so much and uh, like also developer experience kind of sucks. Like in order to use them really well, you need a lot of tooling, which there's probably a lesson here around like, if you need that much tooling, maybe your language should be simpler, or maybe you should just all commit to building lots of awesome tooling. It's an interesting question. Um, let's talk about how does GraphSync work? Let's talk about the client side or the request. <laughs> I should be, it should say GraphSync requester because we don't say client and server because again, it's a pub sub protocol, only there really are clients and servers. Um, the, so uh, how does the GraphSync client work? The basic architecture, the way I describe it, the, 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 or the conceptual shift I, I use to try to help folks understand it is not that I'm sending a request and getting a response back, but rather that I am executing a selector query on my local machine that happens to be backed by an asynchronous stream of data coming in from a remote machine that is actually sending me the data I need to satisfy that query. Um, and the reason it works this way is incremental verifiability. So what I'm doing on the local machine, I have to execute a selector query against the response I get back. And that allows me to see that the responses I'm getting back from the server are actually the correct responses for that selector query. Um, the, the hard part about implementing that is that you're getting an asynchronous stream of responses. You probably also have local data and you may need to combine those two and reconcile them. Um, and the other condition for all of that working is that you need to have a deterministic order to the data, right? Um, this is where if anyone's like mentioned, oh, selectors are always depth first, you know, single threaded traversal, that, that's, that's why. There's a deterministic order in order for the verification to work. Um, there's some, there's some, there's pluses and minuses to that, and you can you can certainly optimize it. You could use other orders, but I think the determinism does help. Um, that's the basic operation of it. Um, how does the server work? Uh, so the GraphSync server is a somewhat analogous to a web server. Um, you have a lot of the same concerns, right? You want to only serve n simultaneous requests at once overall in order to not overload your machine. You want to maybe try to prioritize that distribution between lots of peers. Um, the server is executing a selector query and then as it, 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 as it uh, executes the selector query and the query says, here's the next block I need in order to continue this query, it takes that block and it then sends it over to the wire to the client. Um, and probably one of the more uh, complicated things that the server implements is that, that's pretty critical when you're doing this is back pressure. Um, basically, you do not want to execute the whole selector query and buffer all these blocks into memory that you're going to send over the wire. Um, you need to pause the selector query occasionally to prevent more blocks from coming off of the disk and into memory so that you can queue them up to go over the wire. So you have this like interesting back pressure where you like have like, you don't want to you could load a block into memory and immediately send over send it over the wire and block the selector query until you uh, until you send the next block. But you also may want to actually load dip blocks into memory ahead of the time it goes over the wire up to a certain amount. And the reason is because like the disk I/O is also a, a potential blocking operation. So you want to have those going a little bit in parallel. It can be a little bit tricky to coordinate, and there is a pretty well-developed system in Go GraphSync to, to do that. Um, what else? Okay. Is there any back pressure on the protocol itself, or is this just a local concern? 
Um, you mean like like the preventing the server from sending you too much data? Yeah. Or being like, hey, client, don't give me this big queries. I don't know. Oh, well, oh, uh, there, is, there is in terms of like filtering queries if they're going to be too big. Yeah, that is, there, there is all of that. I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> another key architectural component of Gra Go, Go Graph Sync are these message queues. And this is something that came up with the BitSwap conversation as a thing we want. Um, and I might say, be careful what you do there. Um, what Graph Sync does is, so you have multiple responses executing in parallel, potentially across multiple peers, and then for any given peer, since again, remember GraphSync allows you to have multiple responses, multiple blocks, multiple requests in a given message, you're sending all the responses and potentially requests into a queue that packages them up into appropriately sized messages. Um, and so each message may have multiple, may have like one or more responses with one or more blocks up to a certain so message size because you don't want, you know, because block limits and all that. And also theoretical lib P2P message size limits, which may or may not be real. Um, but uh, in any case, that turns out to be, that's like another layer of concurrency and another layer of logic that turns out to be quite complicated. Um, and I, I, I would encourage folks to, to factor that in. It sounds like a really nice architecture where you just hand it all off to a message queue and that's just arranging things into this nice little packaging line of messages. It's pretty hard to implement. Um, among other things, there's some. if you're doing a big streaming protocol like GraphSync, there's some real fun stuff in there. Like, okay, what if your, queue, what if your peer goes offline, right? Now you have this queue of like packaged up messages that contain multiple responses and you probably want to send all the way back to the queries if they're still executing that like, no, this is not going to go through. Like we need to stop and redo the, you know, wait for the client to come back online and do the, re the query. The logic around that now works. Like I submitted that PR after like, I submitted the fixed PR for that. The original behavior was just like every single one of those messages failed and like, if you're listening for graph sync error messages, like graph sync errors, you get like a hundred of them at once. It was not a pleasant behavior for the higher level libraries. Um, I've submitted a, a thing to, to like fix that. It took me three weeks and like my co-person who's working on it, Rod, who's like one of the sharpest peop people that I've worked with, like that was the one PR where he was like, I don't know what this does, but sure, let's merge it. You know, <laughs> like um, uh, in any case, so yeah, that 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 can be complicated, and I would encourage folks to to be aware of that. Although that sounds like a really simple architecture, it's quite complicated. Um, or maybe Go is just bad at concurrency. I don't know. Um, so GraphSync extension. So the interesting thing about GraphSync is GraphSync has like all the things that people are always like. I would like BitSwap to have this little add-on, right? And that's partly because GraphSync was written for Filecoin, and so like we knew we needed all these things from the 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 start. The simplest. Uh, the simplest uh, graphic extensions are really arbitrary. It's basically you can, you give the extension a name and the data for the extension is an IPLD data structure uh, to be determined by the extension. Um, and then the person who's implementing the server uh, can, uh, there's essentially the ability to set up a hook that looks at every incoming request and whether it's based off the extension or the selector or whatever else, you can uh, choose to accept or, or reject that request. So that's where we have a filtering based off of, like, I don't want to execute an infinite recursive selector against an untrusted peer, right? Um, uh, the default implementation in Filecoin is I don't accept any requests unless they're authorized. Now, there's another kind of too long selector, the protection that we have, which is, oh God, what is it called? Like the selector budget which is like, as you execute the selector, you have a decrementing budget. And that's just a global limit I think you can set for the selectors. Um, we did put that in because at one point, there are like the selector language is too powerful. And as a result, it has some potential geometric time executions uh, for certain types of DAGs, which is really bad. Um, and we haven't fixed that yet. Um, but in the meantime, we're just putting in limits. Uh, so 
So anyway, so that's another thing that you can do to limit, you know, like I don't want to execute too long of a query, um, or you can limit up front and just say, I don't authorize this request. And there's a whole authorization structure. You know, you look at, you look at incoming requests, you can set up a default authorization policy. It's kind of got like all the things you would expect from like, you know, pe the way people do cookies in, in Web2 auth. Yeah, what else? Oh, GrassSync has some, some pretty useful filters um, uh, that you can use, that you can send as extensions to sort of like augment what you can do with the selector. And this is mostly used for like resuming requests. Um, the very first one we wrote was called do not send SIDS, which was just like, along with my request for a selector, I'm sending you a giant list of SIDS that I don't want you to send me the block for in case you pass them in the selector. Um, this was like the very first version of like, we can like, Let's see if we can uh, we can do a resume request. As you might imagine, with a very large DAG, that can be potentially problematic to send a giant list of SIDs um, of everything you have. Uh, so we sort of stopped using that. Um, the one we're using right now is do not send first blocks, which is basically just like execute the selector and after you send me N blocks, start sending me data, right? Um, uh, that works pretty well. There are some potential problems with that. I'll talk a minute, about it in a minute. So ones that could we could do, that wouldn't be that hard to implement, I think. Um, one would be like uh, execute a start at an IPLD path in a selector. We actually already have this machinery in I, the IPLD selector execution in Go. Um, we just haven't written a graphing extension for it. I mean, now these are all extensions. So as you implement them, you potentially create differences between implementations. I mean, they are mostly documented in a somewhat out of date spec, um, but uh, but they do, you know, but the those two at the top are implemented by default by the Go implementation, but they are extensions to the protocol. So it's an interesting, complicated thing. Um, some, yeah, so you could start at an IPLD path. Another one you could do is send a Bloom filter. Now the problem with the Bloom filters, Bloom filters are, False, there are set and you get false positives. You would really like to only get uh, false negatives, which I don't know enough about Bloom filters to know if there's a version of that. Um, but you, so like what you could do is take all you, the list of SIDs you have and you could put them in a Bloom filter and then you could send that and then they could send you back the data. They could potentially miss some SIDs, but you could just try again until you got everything. That's an idea. I don't know. It's a thing. Um, uh, I think it would be pretty easy to implement, and I know some people are interested in that. Um, so there's lots of ways you can... There's an interesting pattern here that I've noticed, which is like the selector language can do a lot of things with IPLD. It's also really useful to do some selections that are really block level. Um, uh, so that's another, another lesson, interesting thing. Um, okay. I want to talk about just very briefly, like... Something that GrassLink does that we're talking about doing in a number of cases that I think is a really interesting concept, right? Um, so essentially, GrassLink has a stream of data incoming and you want to verify it and you're verifying it against a deterministic order. So in GrassLink, it's a selector. A selector is a pretty complicated concept. It could be anything. Right? It could be, uh, it could be like you could write a protocol that had a deterministic order for sending Unix FS and you could verify against it. That would be pretty straightforward as long as it's deterministic. You might want to send a very large block. And we talked a little bit yesterday about the idea of using a grass sync like query to send back um, a, uh, send back essentially a chain of nodes to verify a hash against large data. If you weren't here, for that session, don't worry about it. But it's another potential use case of that kind of concept. And there's some really, and, and the one thing that GrassLink has done is it's implemented this and got it worked out. Um, and if it works against selectors, you could probably copy the code and make it work off of pretty much anything because that they're pretty complicated. Um, the, the other, and then the other addition to this, which I think we're starting to have conversations about is what if the, rather than having the person who sends you the list of things you're gonna go over send you the data as well, what if they just send you the list of things that a deterministic traversal is going to go over and then you get the blocks themselves yourself with a protocol like BitSwap? Um, and that's what, we're gonna have a session on this thing called manifests. 
Um, and I think that that's, that's a really interesting concept because that's a very straightforward way to plan queries. Um, you can, you know, um, you get a list, you get essentially a list of things you're going to go over and then you go get them yourself and verify against it. Now that gets complicated because if you just get the list, it's not verified at all. Right. So you have, to, then you have this interesting, like trust incremental verifiability problem where you want to probably ask ahead in a, like in a manifest queue, but then you probably need to constantly not get too far ahead such that you get too much data. Um, but you also want to balance that against, I want to stay ahead of, like, I want to always have data requests out so I can get them as quickly as possible. Um, so that's a really interesting concept. I see it come up a lot. There's some good code in GrassLink to deal with that, I think, if you're working in Go. Again, probably concurrency in another language, you maybe it's not a hard thing to do. Um, so yeah, let's see, what else? Yeah, I would say, be aware, if you, this is another one where like, sounds super implement, uh, suitable to implement, there are dragons in there. Um, like, you know, <laughs> take a look at it before, take a look at what exists before you think, I'll just go implement this and it'll work. Okay, uh, lessons. This is where some of the slides get a little uh, messy because I'm sort of, yeah, I ran out of time. Um, okay, well, first of all, obvious uh, lessons, be careful what you ask for. Um, so grassing at this point, I'm, I'm going to make a bold statement, which is that it works mostly at this point after three years of development, like lots of rounds of like clearing out all the memory leaks and which I guess, again, another wouldn't have happened in, in certain languages. Um, but in any case, you know, I mean, Estuary has asked for lots of graph sync requests. We've tested it under a decent amount of load. Mas o menos, you know, like it's, it's, you know, there, there, it is not a perfect library. And among other things, well, I'll get to this, there's another lesson in there, but um, there is one thing I do want to respond to. There, I have heard a few times, grass sync is slow. Um, and I just want to refute that um, by saying, um, no, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> that is the unanger translated version of that. Uh, the, look, here's the thing: we have not tested point-to-point -point performance in libp2p for real. Um, like, like we we have, like BitSwap is a block protocol. We have not tested how fast we can move streams for large amounts of data. And um, you can go in the Slack channel. You can go on all of the annoying uh, messages I've sent if you're on the Filecoin Slack and in various channels. Um, but like HTTP over libp2p is slow. Like you, you the, the trick is that we got to get down to the protocol layer. And I think that's a worthwhile topic and try to figure out like what the protocol layer, I mean like the, the transport layer and really try to figure that out. Um, but like... <laughs> I'm sorry to be a jerk. This is not the case. It's doing it, like you do have some problems with like, and I and I say this after a year of gaslighting myself on this. I'm not the type of person who like tries to tries to just be like you're wrong. But like I've really dug into this, and um, I'm uh, anyway. This probably doesn't even concern you. I should take it up with my manager. But um, and <laughs> but FYI, uh, there is a let me see. Oh no. Oh yeah. The slides really end here. Um, uh, but there's a really, this leads to a really important lesson, um, which is that like Grassic is freaking complicated. And there's a downside to complicated protocols, which is that like people don't understand how they work. When they don't work, they, they tend to blame the people who wrote them. But more importantly, but aside from personal challenges, like the, the, it means they're harder to implement, harder to understand, harder for other people to work off of, right? Now, you might have seen from the bit, the bit swap when you add sessions and all that is also complicated. And to some extent, like writing network protocols is complicated. That's another thing to keep in mind um, that you will not get it right on the first try. Um, but there, the, but in any case, it's a lesson. It's like, why did we need to execute the entire selector language up front, right? Maybe we should have started with just a couple. Maybe we should have started with not a multi-request per message protocol. If I could go back and do one thing, I would have listened to Volker, who is always right, by the way, if you, if you, <laughs> if you hear him say something, like pay attention. He like, one time he was, uh, he, he, Volker is, works in Rust. I think he's currently on FVM. Uh, he's sort of like someone who's been at Protocol Labs for a while, but isn't very well known. Uh, he, he one time to me was like, I have this idea for a database table. Um, I wrote a thing in Rust and I was like, 
and I was there, the hackathon. I was like, oh yeah, I'll port it to Go. That thing runs the indexer now. Um, uh, he, he's, 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 anyway, so that's the sidebar. But um, he had said, just make it a single request response. Simple protocols are, are, simple, are easier to work with. And I was like, no, I have this design document that I was given by the luminaries. Um, and, and, you know, that would, that was, that would have been simpler. Um, uh, other, yeah, other lessons. I think, like, I am not convinced of the complete value of a streaming protocol for large requests. Um, and a lot of people push me on this, but I think I'm, and I'm kind of coming around that if you're executing a very complicated query in a request response form, you lose like the ability to split things easily, which is kind of our superpower, right? Like if we're gonna, we're not trying to, so GrassLink will work well, uh, if, you know, if we work out all the low level things, it can certainly compete with HTTP, right? But like, we're trying to be better than the regular web and we have an uneven playing field and that most of our nodes are not like Amazon nodes. We have some, but like a lot of them are not like gonna be as good. So we need to have multi-party transfer, right? Like that's how we win um, on, not win, yeah, any, in any case. Uh, like, like it, so you should plan for request splitting at the beginning. And that may mean that send, sending big queries is not always the right thing. The other thing is also like, I think we've said this a few times, but like the higher the data, mo higher level the data model you work at, the more you are, um, the more you're taking on like a lot of shared understanding between the two nodes, right? Um, so yes, you can execute a selector query against any encoding that IPLD Prime supports. And probably at this point, if you're talking between two Filecoin nodes, cause we've sort of piggybacked along the, uh, uh, on the chain upgrade process to force upgrades to the protocol, um, uh, you will be able to do like cool Unix FS queries and all that, but it's a lot of things that, that need to be like shared understanding. And then like, what if you add something new? Like now, how do you communicate that? Um, so you may, th there's a question. Do you want to put all the different possible higher level data models in a single protocol? Or do you want to do multiple protocols for all the higher level stuff and then just have like a bit swap underneath to move the blocks around? I don't know. Um, yeah, those are a lot of thoughts. A lot of things. Questions? What's your sense that if I go and replace the usage of graphs right now with this block, in terms of like, is the, basically, is the changes to graphs, is, is it worth it in the sense of like, how it's now being used versus like, what if I just pack a bunch of stuff on top of this block and use that pack on top? Yeah, so, I would say, so it depends on your goals, right? Like if you're, like Filecoin's usage of GraphSync is for point-to-point -point transfers. And like, it's probably for that. I would just use GraphSync, right? I mean, if you want to use libp2p. Uh, the, for, what I would say is that I think, I mean, there's, there is a problem with BitSwap around the like deep graphs, right? You probably need a solution for that. I think these sort of ideas of manifest protocols to get ahead of your like local traversal uh, in terms of what you know about the graph are probably sufficient for that. Um, there are certain queries where it would just be simpler to use graph sync. Like if your goal is to get to a deep path in a directory, like that's why would you split that up? Like it's, it's sufficiently linear that you would just, that, that you might as well just get all the blocks up to the file and then go to BitSwap. Um, and there's probably a lot, there's some interesting thinking about like, when is it better to split up queries? Cause there, if you're truly traversing like a blockchain, like a traditional blockchain, not a Falcon blockchain, like there's no value in splitting that for the most part, though maybe you wanna get like the blocks from multiple peer, uh, yeah, you know, there's still value, I guess. But if it's small enough, you're probably going to save data just going round trip and getting everything at once. If the data is small, uh, not if the, not uh, not the shape of the graph, but more like if you've got lots of nodes, you might as well just hand it to one peer and get it back quickly. Yeah. Um, so what do you think? So there, there's how important do you think the deterministic part of this of the incremental there? In particular, I'm thinking about like 
<laughs> there should be some benefit that you get when your graph has breadth to it, right? Mm -hmm. And and by like forcing like like the traversal order to go like linearly, you, you like you do, you don't get anything out of that. Sure. Um, yeah, so it's like how how important do you think that is? Because you, you could build a verifiable streaming protocol that wasn't deterministic. It would just require maybe more memory on the side of the time. Yeah, I mean you can also build one that's deterministic but not very linear, like, you know, you can, you can, you can make it breath first, right? As long as you say it's this order of breath first. Um, the, so, and then yes, you can play games with trust, right? The only thing I would say about that, like, right? You, when I say play games with trust, like if you want to make it non-deterministic, maybe you accept a certain amount of more stuff buffered in memory before you can verify it, right? I don't mean, I don't mean, I don't mean from a trust perspective. I mean, like, like a, I have a branching you know, mm -hmm. file thing, right? Right. Instead of, you know, walking each of the blocks in some traversal order, like once I've hit a node that has, you know, whatever, 256 spread, right. whichever order I get those blocks in shouldn't really matter. I can verify them all the same. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think the UnixFS file case is a good example of where you should split it between GraphSync and, and, uh, and BitSwap. Or you don't even need to use graph sync, but like a linear traversal and just fetch it, right? Like, so like you should, like, I mean, the simplest thing would be to transmit that tree of like very small blocks that, you know, lay out a Unix FS thing down to the, down to the like raw blocks at the bottom and then go to bit swap. But even, but even graph sync could, I, I shouldn't say even graph sync, I should say even a like graph oriented Protocol right. because verifiable streaming right. could send me them in a non-determinist order. Well, but what is the uh, you could, but like I mean, presumably you want like er, the more non-determinist, uh, like uh, so. Is there a way in which non the more non-deterministic it is, the more you have to accept untrusted data? No, say not if you like right like that's all you you can ask for multiple blocks in parallel. Sure. And even though you're you're forcing, even though you're you can't do unverifiable stuff. Right, because it's block by block verification. But the, the problem is that you don't know that the query was executed correctly, right? Unless you get a look of or something for the individual pieces. Like you can you can verify that this thing matches to this to this hash, right? You don't know that that hash was the hash. Until you have the and block before. The selector things, right? Even if you just do straight traversal, unless you get the thing with the path to the root, which you could probably send along, and then you can just send it in an trade order. It's not, depends on the size of the block, there's a lot of overhead, but you could do that, something like that, right? That's the problem with the untrusted, that's why the data is untrusted. It's not that the shop verification doesn't work, it's that you don't know, is this actually the right hash in my graph? To go back to the root. Like in half this case, you have to verify the manifest. And yeah, if you have a manifest that goes away because that basically gives you removal proof that uh, you can go hash things together to the top. I mean, there are certain things that say, you know, like if I'm doing like path traversal, explore field, explore field all the way down, where like, yeah, that you have to do it in a, in a linear order. But if I want to say, like, get me. You know, I, I reach the map and say, like, get me all of the elements in the map, right? Because my, my query is get me all, all can therefore be parallelized. But you, when you say the map, in that case, you're talking about a single level. Yeah, I mean, I mean as the thing goes down, so like, again, yeah, first, you know, the simple example is like the, you know, I have a, I have a large branching tree for my sure. file, right? Um, I want to get the whole set. I, I, at some point, my you know, my request, my subgraph description says I want the whole second layer. As soon as I say I want all instead of I want next, I have the ability to like whether I get one and then two or two and then one it doesn't matter to me because they're both. Assuming you're not asking for the second and third layer at once. Yeah, yeah, just the second. Layer. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there is like, there's a point of termination, 
in, in a selector, right? Where you're like, I'm not going to go, I'm at the last layer of links. And that you can totally verify in whatever order you want. Um, because you have the thing immediately before it that tells you these are the links that are in this block. Um, but there are cases where there's more complicated things to do. Honestly, I don't think you get that much out of non-determinism. I think you just, what we ought to focus on is parallelizing our execution and sending the data quickly. Because like, you know, the order, like if you get a long list, as long as you can execute. All right. Yes, yes. Yeah.